Hi everyone, it's V Spear, the Director of Impact here at the James Beard Foundation, coming to you for our seafood exploration today as part of the industry support seminars. I've moved in front of this beautiful picture of the sea um, to be on brand for today. We are so excited to have some of our greatest friends in the seafood industry joining us today for a brief conversation on the past, the present, and where we even see the future going. As always, we're gonna pretend like this is just an experience where we're meeting with three of our best friends who happen to be experts in the seafood industry and they're gonna share their particular view of what's happening in their worlds. It's not to meant to be sort of like the be all end all authority on the seafood industry or what's happening. It's just meant to be a friendly conversation about what's happening in these folks' lives. Um, and we'll continue these conversations as it relates to the state of seafood, you know, for the next several weeks. So there'll be plenty more opportunities if we don't get into your particular um, place within within the industry to explore that more deeply um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, so I want to hand it over now to Emily, who's going to explain how you can interact with us. Today's is a little bit different in that it's going to be more of a panel discussion as opposed to a presentation. So we really want to see a lot of questions. Um, Emily, if you wouldn't mind. Thank I'm you. Muted. <laughs> Some of them are vacuuming. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and welcome back. Um, as always, we we want your questions to come in as you have them, because we know sometimes they can pop up as you're thinking about something or as a topic comes up, um, and we're going to do our best to get to all of them. You can send them in using the questions function or the chat function. Um, as always, this is being recorded, so with this webinar will be available as long as all of our uh, as well as all of our past webinars on uh, jamesbeard.org slash industry dash support dash webinars, which we'll send out afterwards. Uh, and if you're having any technical difficulties, you can't hear, your questions aren't coming through, uh, just shoot us a note through the chat function. Um, and if you don't hear from us, you can send us an email and we'll do our best. Thanks very much. Great, thanks Emily. Um, and we did get several questions ahead of time. So we've got those loaded up here in the queue just to give you an idea. We're gonna be talking about grocery trends. We're gonna be talking about what's on the plate, even ways to swirl up canned tuna fish. So we'll get to it all. We have a couple pre-planned questions for the panelists ahead of time, and then we'll get into live questions in the last like 20 minutes or so. First, I would like to introduce Jennifer Bushman, who is joining us. Welcome, Jennifer. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and what you've been working on? Yes, I mean, uh, I am a, a champion of ethical aquaculture and water farmers. I have a consultancy that helps with strategic development, pretty much all of the connective tissue in creating that chain of well-being from the water all the way to market. I've been doing that for more than a decade. In my past life, though, I was a cookbook author and did a lot of television work and I'm a James Beard nominee. So I've always mm. felt it's always felt very, very close to my heart. And of course, right now telling that farmer story and helping figure out how to get the fish from point A to point B smoothly in order to be able to provide nutritious delicious food at a time when we need it most is really what's been at the forefront of my mind yeah absolutely thank you for that Jennifer and Cliff tell us a little bit about yourself and the seafood source sure um, so seafoodsource.com is a uh, new site for um, industry news from the global seafood industry. Uh, we cover, uh, we try to cover boat to plate, um, but in reality, uh, it's much more than that even. Um, and um, I've been executive editor there for four years. I started in the newspaper industry um, and live in Portland, Maine and eat a lot of good seafood here. Yeah, we're all jealous of you out there in Portland, Maine. Must be beautiful, at least being able to look out the window. <laughs> it is. Uh, Barton, tell me a little bit about you. Hey, everyone. I, my name is Barton Seaver. I, I'm really thrilled to be here. And first and foremost, uh, I'd like to say thank you, uh, V, to you and Emily, uh, but to the entire James Beard family for the leadership uh, that you are, are showing uh, and, and undertaking for the industry, for all of us. Uh, you really are making a difference in dark times, so thank you. Uh, I, like Cliff, live on the coast of Maine, uh, the beautiful, hard, rocky, ragged coast uh, where it is delicious, but also we got insulted with seven and a half inches of snow just the other day. So um, we're, we're still in transition up here, but uh, my I am a, uh, a chef for many, many years, uh, a couple decades in restaurants all over the world, but got very interested in sustainable seafood. It really is my passion. I am now a chef, author, and I would consider myself a seafood evangelist. 
in that it is my mission to get more people across all demographics to eat more seafood uh, for environmental, health, and economic reasons. So, Excellent. Thanks for having Thank me. You. Yeah, absolutely. Um, question for the panel, just kicking off, and it's it's been on the forefronts of many people's minds, mine included, as I sit with a freezer full of fish. Um, what what are you seeing in terms of the increase of frozen foods, and what are fisheries doing to work with retailers on that front? Maybe Jennifer start. Yes, I mean the, there's certainly particularly the fact that there there have been a couple of factors that have led us to what I I've always said, and I think the all of us would agree, which is that frozen really is. And so there are some things that are very interesting that are coming out of this crisis, this situation. One is there was a lot of fear, frankly, that the borders were going to get shut down. And we didn't really know whether or not we were going to be able to keep the fish flowing, that fish that was coming from out of the country. And, and I think that part of part of being able to make sure that there were going to be stocks i know that a lot of the the fish farmers that i work with the ethical aquaculturists that i work with were bringing in containers of frozen fish and groups like whole foods were buying it by the container fill every single week just to be able to stockpile fish so mm -hmm. there's that the other thing that has happened at grocery is that the fish and seafood case is is very high in terms of its labor. You know, I mean, when we think about fish and seafood, that case has to be broken down, cleaned. It has to be filled with ice the next morning and reset every single day. Well, when stocking shelves and getting, you know, goods out there as fast as possible is king, that meant that our fresh, and, fresh fish and seafood case was really somewhat compressed. A lot of the large retailers were only stocking those cases once a day. So they would come in, they would stock them in the morning and what sold was sold out. So it really did put the focus on anything that was prepared and packaged, already pre-packaged IQF and then, and then those things that were, excuse me, and those things that were frozen. So mm. that's kind of where people are finding it. Stocking that pandemic pantry meant that we were looking for more frozen, fresh, uh, frozen fish and seafood. Yeah, absolutely. And now that we're a couple weeks out from that, um, you know, Barton, there's not a lot of small local fisheries that can pack like that and can provide like that. How are you seeing it affect the local fishermen with day catch? Uh, well, it's particularly uh, volatile for them and, and disastrous. Uh, you know, to add a couple of points to what Jennifer was talking about, what she said, you know, worry about closing the borders. Uh, well, that would have closed closed our borders to 90 plus percent of the seafood that we eat in this country. Uh, and so that, that's not just a minor inconvenience. It is a, a massive disruption, uh, unlike any other globally food traded food commodity. Uh, seafood is traded, is, is the most traded food commodity, uh, more than double both corn and soy combined uh, in terms of global volume. So it, it's astounding what, what that threat really means. Uh, you know, and it's interesting. I think there, there's a couple of macro shifts that have been leading us more towards fr fresh frozen, fr high quality frozen product for a while. Uh, but leading the vanguard on the fresh side has been that narrative heavy, local, small scale artisan fisher. Uh, mm -hmm. And whether that's in Alaska and completely remote or whether it's literally across the street from me where I sit in Freeport, Maine. Um, those are the folks that we're serving directly. I think a lot of the people that might be listening to this webinar today, the independent restaurants that were selling narratives, that were invested in the communities that at their back door, as much as invested in the communities in their front door. Um, and it, it's been disastrous uh, in that, you know, especially where I sit here in Maine, you know, the three biggest things sort of on my radar are lobsters, which the season is coming up, scallops, which just opened. So the, two highest value fisheries by far, uh, and then oysters. And all of those at high volume or at high level go into those white tablecloth restaurants and that it's just evaporated. Um, but of course, fishermen are islands unto themselves, quite literally in their operations. Uh, they are amongst the bravest and most capable people I've, I've ever come in contact with. And so watching the extreme pivot uh, that some of these groups have made uh, is truly inspiring. And just one example here, uh, up in Maine, there's a, a woman, Jen Levin, uh, who used to run the seafood programs at uh, Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Uh, and she 
uh, went off to, to form Gulf of Maine Sashimi, uh, an organization that's trying on a very local level to bring high quality Gulf of Maine fish to restaurant markets. And this is Haddock and Hake and Cod and Pollock and Monkfish. Uh, and her, you know, a couple of months into her business and her business completely dried up in restaurants. So she pivoted and turned around and asked, you know, went calling on people in Maine and her business is up several hundred percent in terms yeah. of volume and what she's able to do. So, uh, and I think that portends some momentums into the future uh, mm -hmm. that people have found that virtual or realistic farmer's market approach to fish to local fisheries. Uh, and I think that's going to be with us for a while. Absolutely. Yeah. We've heard that a lot, even with the fresh food market and with the, you know, boutique sausage market, it's really, it's back to a neighbor to neighbor cold call game. And, and in some ways that's a great relationship to start building and start figuring out. And now Cliff, I know that you're covering a lot of how this is affecting restaurants and what restaurants are doing to recover. Um, I was reading something about Lisa Hogan in Santa Monica Seafood partnering with a private club to do like a dinner pickup meal type thing where they essentially curate a dinner, you pick it up, you get on a Zoom with them later and you have an in-house experience. Are you seeing other fisheries and other seafood markets um, trying to do these unique new distributions? Yeah, so the distribution chain, um, as Barton mentioned, is typically very international with seafood. Um, and that is just the supply chains in chaos right now. Um, so companies of all sizes from, um, you know, people who own their own boat and catch their own fish and sell it themselves all the way up to, you know, giant companies like Pacific Seafood are all equally crashing about trying to figure out what's, what's going to work for them and how long they can hold on uh, with their old business model and how fast they can pivot to a new business model. So you're seeing, um, I mean, to mention Pacific Seafood, um, they're down, I'm trying to find Frank Dulcich, the CEO, just did an interview, which he said, um, we've seen a 200% increase in retail and a 45% drop in food service. Um, and their business split is 45% food service and 65% retail. Um, mm -hmm. So it, as you can imagine, even with um, still making sales, that's still a massive change to their business model. So everyone is trying to figure out um, how to navigate this new landscape we're in and whether they need to figure it out or whether they can just hold on tight um, to what they were doing. But um, every everyone in every company is <laughs> rapidly learning new skills and um, being shifted into uh, new responsibilities, um, trying to figure out, you know, you, you see, um, people who formerly um, were managing major accounts are now, um, you know, selling seafood themselves, um, you know, on the individual level. And um, it's whatever you can do to get through the short term, I think, for a lot of these companies um, for um, just to give you a couple more examples, Catalina Offshore Products in California, um, they're down 50 percent, but their retail operation is is doing better. Um, so. Uh, True World Group, which is one of the biggest providers of uh, sashimi grade fish to sushi operations in the US and Europe, um, they're down 80%. Excuse me. So um, they're really struggling because people typically eat sushi in restaurants. Um, so it depends on the, on the company, but I know a lot of companies are looking at um, anything they can do like that event hosted by Santa Monica Seafood, which is always an innovator in, in the sector. Um, to try and bring excitement to seafood and get people thinking about seafood. I found another quote that I thought was really interesting that I'll read to you. Um, it's from James Mullen, who's the vice president of sales for Atlantic Capes Fisher Fisheries in, in New Jersey. And his quote was, we read in the newspaper about retail business booming, and there's some truth to that. There's been a spike in demand, but as awareness of the economic situation dawns on people, sales for high-priced seafoods items is weak we're seeing the trend go to hot dogs. So yep. um, the, the question is, uh, I mean, short term, people are buying seafood in, in grocery stores still. You're seeing canned seafood and frozen seafood fly off the shelves. Um, the, the fresh seafood, is, as Jennifer mentioned, is uh, definitely struggling. And a lot of seafood counters have been shut down. They're using, the grocery stores are using the labor elsewhere in the store. Um, so um, 
there's definitely going to be winners and losers. And uh, innovation is really going to be the name of the game uh, when it comes to um, surviving, thriving, short term and potentially long term. Yeah, thank you for that, Cliff. A, a question that gets raised is, you know, we we t- we talk about and we hope that this is just a couple more weeks, right, or maybe like a month or or not too much longer. In the cases of what's being fished out there, how long can can fish go unfarmed? How long can the oysters lay in their bed? Like, is there a possibility of you know sort of slowing down production and then when things go back to normal, having you know over time essentially to harvest those those products. Um, Jennifer, I'm curious what you think about that. Well, I'm hearing that from, you know, my, my farmer friends and Mm -hmm. the reality is the fish get to a certain size. And if, if, for example, if the waters are getting warmer, spring comes, the fish grow faster, Mm -hmm. then you are going to end up with, with fish in the water that you have to, you have to harvest. You don't have a choice. So we'll, we'll move to frozen and we will do all of the portions. We'll figure out in the market what's going to be the most useful. And then we'll and then we'll freeze in preparation for that. One of the one of the statistics that I had heard was that the fish and, fish and seafood sales were up 100 percent in the first two weeks of this pandemic. That as people were thinking about stocking, they were thinking about feeding themselves well. Kind of reality, as you said, hadn't set in. They we were really buying a lot of fish and seafood at retail. That's down to it's about 50 percent up on average. And this is from the large big 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 box stores to the specialty retailers to Whole Foods. These numbers pretty much have been really cur- you know, consistent throughout the space. But the big issue is we were, and, and the Beard Foundation, and I know, I know Bart and Cliff, we've all been trying really hard to get people not to just eat the big three. And yeah. the problem is in a time like this, uh, we're all we're seeing get stocked. I mean, if if you're in the salmon business, you're you know you're in really good shape. But if you're you know if you're if you're fishing or you're farming something that's a little bit more esoteric or for sure that's more expensive, yeah, you've you've got a you've got a pretty quick problem. Yeah, Barton, um, you know I'm guilty of it myself. I've got can't what did my wife go out and buy right we got tuna fish we got salmon we got shrimp we got mussels we got things that we knew we could like you know they would last a long time or they my kids will eat it like all that kind of stuff like that people are thinking um what are what do you think is going to happen Barton, in the future of diversifying the fish that we put on the plate without chefs leading that and saying hey here's a rockfish hey here's a monkfish hey here's a lionfish this is how you prepare it this is what it tastes like yeah all right to that specific question, I think there's uh, both going to be a huge drop off, as, as Jennifer was just saying, that if you have limited labor, limited space, limited attention and focus to a, a decreasing market of, of fresh, where does your cobia fit in? Where does your right. barramundi fit in? Right. Absolutely fantastic products that mm-hmm. were gaining market appeal, um, but in these times of, of needing comfort we want comfort foods and we eat the things we are comfortable with um so yeah i think on a broad scale we're going to see a couple of steps back there but on the micro scale as these smaller scale fisheries pivot as farms pivot uh we're going to see as they make those connections direct to consumer those consumers are going to be far more likely to challenge themselves to try something new if the person that raised it is, is the one handing it to them. Right. Uh, you know, purple cauliflower and Romanesco. I mean, the damn thing looks like like something <laughs> that came out of an alien organ. You know, yes. it's like, ah, it's terrifying. But when a farmer, when she's handing it to you with dirty fingernails, that's just like, here's my labor. This is the beauty of it. Like, okay, cool. Yeah. Bear Mundi, the same thing. Uh, so a I do think that you will see re- yeah, a, a bit of a resurgence uh, in diversity from those small-scale local artisans. Um, and if I could add to that, the, yeah. yeah, so um, in the past, and by the past, I mean three months ago, um, we saw small-scale um, aquaculture farmers popping up all over the country, but their mob business model was built on white tablecloth restaurants um, selling um, specialty fish like pompano or um you know high-end trout um and um very quickly they're pivoting to selling locally um and so 
you'll definitely see, like in Maine, we have a nice bounty of local seafood that Barton can, has written, literally written books about. Um, but um, wherever you're living in the US, I mean, there's, there's aquaculture happening all over the country and um, you're gonna have access to seafood that you might even not have known it was there in your backyard. And, and so those type of connections may be what comes out of this and eating what's local. Uh, like Barton was saying, even if, you know, shrimp doesn't typically grow in Minnesota, um, there's now an RAS facility that's growing shrimp in the Midwest. So uh, you can find that and um, it's, it's out there. And hopefully those connections get made with the business model pivoting to selling local rather than selling to white tablecloth across the country. So for seafood growers, that's potentially a silver lining. Um, and, and for consumers, for eaters as well, seeing what's being grown in your backyard. And Jennifer, do you think that's something that'll be reinforced with the limitations there are in distribution right now? You know, big trucks going to big cities that have big white table restaurants now essentially maybe keeping a little bit more of that product closer to home or closer to port. What do you think will happen? I mean, there's there's a lot of conversation about that because there are all sorts of issues in the distribution channel, right? So if it's first, the first thing that happened was there were a passenger flights, which normally would have carried somewhere around 60 metric tons of cargo that would have been fish or whatever coming into the U.S. Because those passenger flights were canceled, what we originally thought, and Cliff can probably speak to this too, I mean, a, a plane that's a passenger plane that's flying ghost flights without passengers could actually carry almost 200 metric tons. But what we found happened was that those routes were being cut based on limitations and concerns at the airport with, with you know, staffing to be able to get that cargo off the planes and to be able to get it where it needs to go. So you had that, the compression of how many flights were going to be available. Cargo planes themselves, there always was a limited amount of cargo planes. So if you were flying fish in, um, and the ports also have a limited amount of now they're being much more careful about who's there and about what windows of time they allow even pick up. So there was that, navigating that. The thing about trucking that was really interesting was that although truckers want to be out there delivering good, healthy food for all of us, they one of the things that happened was one, when places are closed while they're out delivering food across the country, they don't have any place to eat. So yeah. there's the issue with not being able to stop at rest stops to go to the restroom and not mm -hmm. being able, because it's illegal now to park there, and also not being able to get food on the road. So mm -hmm. one of the programs that we worked on at Quarry Arctic was we actually have been making sure that we get meals to the truckers through parties and other groups in order to make sure that they're getting fed properly to be able to get the fish from point A to point B. So we can truck fish. It's more efficient for us to bring it in by ship, have it frozen, be able to truck it to Chicago. Rick Bayless, you know, has this incredible program. We sent fish to his program with U.S. Foods. But all of a sudden, I can tell you that air freight in that time when we needed cargo to go into from, from our processor in Germany at Amsterdam to LA, there were two flights that were cargo and the cost was over $3 more a pound than it had been the day before. Wow, yeah. So it's so. just every day is a new challenge and I have been just applauding those that have been in the distribution. And that again is anyone that is working at the harvest stations, that's working on the boats to those that are that are processing. I mean, all of these things that have happened in Chile and in Norway to make sure people are safe and that they're healthy while they're working on these processing lines. And then thinking about what that distribution channel looks like and making sure that those people are safe because they want to work. It's yeah, just that they're concerned for their own health and we have to be actively involved in that to be able to get the fish from point A to point B. Yeah, that's great perspective, Jennifer. Um, we have a litany of questions, so I'm gonna move on from this topic just a little bit. Um, uh, Robert says, happy belated birthday, Barton, and has a question for you as well. So oh, thank you. <laughs> um, talking about, capital investments, right, in both the seafood industry and in the sell or the grown seafood industry. Where do you guys, uh, maybe starting with Barton, think regulatory responsiveness to cultivated cell-based seafood startups like Blue Nalu or Finless Foods is going to lay in this new world we're living in? Uh, well, I think just from a financial standpoint, those are heavily capitalized. 
um, you know, that's not something you're coming into as a mom and pop operation. Somebody, you know, the way a fisherman might start growing kelp, uh, you know, off the back of a boat just because it's a cool thing to do. You know, these these are companies that are backed by, I mean, I believe Tyson money, Cargill money, yeah. and there is wicked serious money. Listen to me, New Englander, wicked serious um, money involved in this. So I, I think that there is going to be just a survival of the fittest aspect of that at some mm -hmm. point. Plus also you're dealing with, I think, an inherent, I, I believe an inherently more shelf stable product where the process of growing it, because you're not dealing with a, a live salmon that has its own ideas about how to grow and when to grow. Um, so I think that you're just dealing with an inherently more controlled production environment. So, uh, but also I think that, you know, plant-based, cell-based seafood is something that I welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll be great to have the word seafood or whatever iteration of, of letters ends up being called. Uh, just shining a positive light on the entire category. Um, so I welcome it. I, I do think that there is a great uh, danger, though, of that becoming a competitive force and saying, oh, you should eat this because all seafood is bad. and having this crisis be somewhat of a crucible moment for that. Um, but as a product category, I welcome it. I think it has a lot of good to offer. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see where it comes out in all of this. Yeah, Plus, absolutely. Um, which brings us to another question with, Jennifer mentioned earlier, seafood was up 100%. Now it's still up 50% in the frozen category and a lot more fish is being frozen than displayed in the seafood case. Do we think though, as people stock up on these things and now need to use up that product, there'll be any kind of um, benefit in reducing the overfishing that gets done during this time? Or do we think the market is still just as strong as it was previous? anyone? I'm happy to jump in. Um, yeah. So uh, if you're buying seafood from the United States, by and large, it's sustainable. So what's going to be hurt is if you're buying domestic seafood, um, like Alaska sockeye salmon, the season's coming up, um, or, you know, Maine cusk, right? That's what I'm saying. Well, it may not be. Um, but um, if you're buying, that's, that's sustainable seafood. Um, it's the 65 to 90% of seafood that's imported to this country. Uh, and that figures in dispute because there's some that's sent overseas for processing and then comes back into the country. Um, but um, it's that that has a little bit more question mark, but the move to sustainability is, um, I mean, we report on it a lot at Seafood Source. You can, you can find all sorts of um, reporting on every aspect of of sustainability um, in seafood there. And um, th the movement is happening. Uh, there's definitely concern that, you know, amidst the scramble to preserve sales and preserve your company that you're spending less time thinking about that. And that's unfortunate. And so um, there needs to be an effort by whoever has time and ability to hold feet to the fire, excuse me, and make sure that, um, commitments made last year are still being held to this year and next year. Um, but um, it's, um, it's, I, I don't think you'll see, uh, there's, the, the fish are by and large going to, I don't want to put this, um, maybe what I would say is that us not eating fish is not the solution to sustainability um, because that fish is still going to be eaten somewhere um, and there's still going to be problems with overfishing and illegal fishing with or without uh, the United States taking part in that. It's, I think, a much better force to have U.S. companies and companies that sell into the U.S. a part of that conversation and working for the betterment of the global seafood industry. Um, rather than the U.S. market just disappearing out of the global seafood picture. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, of course. 
Um, with the market, and we're talking about some of these more, the diversification of fish, more expensive products, you're coming up on lobster season, scallop season, like you said, while people are really kind of stocking their pantries right now with, I saw Francis Lamb was eating a bologna sandwich the other day. You know, people are just like getting into <laughs> things that you wouldn't expect. Um, where do we think the price of fish is headed when we can go back into restaurants, but where do we think the price of fish is headed maybe during this season. Let's say that the, the quarantine extends well into the summer. Like, we don't want that, but if it does, do we see the price of lobster being lower? Do we see people not getting as high a return? Will it surge? What do you guys think? The I actually had a conversation where uh, one of the projects that I work on is with Menus of Change, mm -hmm. and the healthy menus are indeed collaborative with the Culinary Institute of America. And we have as part of that collaborative, uh, the responsibility of almost 100 million meals a day. So mm -hmm. Compass, Aramark, Sodexo, and a number of the large food service entities and restaurant groups are part of that. And what we're hearing is that, you know, the restaurant landscape, it's unfortunate, but it's not going to go from the faucet off to the faucet on. There's a lot of conversation about what will those menus look like, and, and they're going to be smaller. When you think about some restaurants that maybe were on the verge of going out of business, they're, they're probably not going to be reopened. And mm -hmm. so when I think about what is going to be on the menu, it's very similar. The conversations we're having is that it's going to be very similar to how that fish and seafood case looks. The menus are going to be smaller. They're going to have items on it that they know are going to sell, and they're going to be applications of those items that they know are going to be going to be popular. So when I think of somebody like Andrew Gruel with Slapfish, who has a takeout delivery model anyway, and he does things in a taco form and lots of like, you know, anytime you want to call it, you know, Baja style this or whatever, those things are going to sell. And I can tell you that pricing, so it depends because most of the very highly sustainable aquaculturists that I work for, their prices are holding steady. And the reason why is because there isn't a lot of it. So those those retailers, those restaurants that have made true sustainable commitments and want to stick with that and the customers that follow them, they're standing by that. So we mm -hmm. haven't seen a drop in price or anyone ask, but I can tell you in those other esoteric fish and the ones that were mainly, you know, food service driven, um, it's going to be tough. And there was a great article that um, Dan Barber was interviewed. I don't know if you saw this, but he was mm -hmm. talking about how he felt for so many years in being business at Blue Hill at Stone Barn that they were, it was really great to have this relationship with the pheasant farmer and they bought all that he could produce. And then all, all of a sudden they're out of business and all of the support that that farmer had is gone. And that all that responsibility is on you. So right. it's, I think it's going to change even someone like that and the way they source because they want to make sure that people's businesses are stable. And so prices right. are going to go down in those cases. And I think that what we're going to be demanding is going to be a little bit different because it's going to be slow, for sure. Yeah, makes sense. Um, we had a uh, question come up. V, if, I, if I could chime in on that. Oh, sure, go ahead. I was going to, uh, lobster prices this point in the season, uh, when they're still fishing offshore before the molt season and the, the new shell shedders uh, begin to come ashore, and, and when the industry really kicks into overdrive with about 4,500 uh, lobster men and women out there, uh, right now, dock prices should be 10 to $12 a pound. And right now, you can buy lobsters retail for seven bucks. Uh, yeah. Boats are getting two to $4 a pound. And um, that doesn't cover gas. I mean, no. it doesn't cover fuel. And, and uh, you know, in so much of our, just the lobster industry feeds Maine, yeah. uh, you know, for the tourist trade. And then a lot of it goes to China. And so, um, those prices are going to go down. Uh, and the other thing I'm really worried about is, is much what Jennifer was saying, uh, to another extent, though, is that like scallop uh, fishery opened two weeks ago. And people are still going out and scalloping. And there's companies that are putting up 100,000 pounds of scallops a day in the freezer. And so even if demand comes back, there's going to be such a glut of inventory uh, mm -hmm. in some of these some of these markets that it, it it's going to keep prices depressed for a long time. Uh, if you know, if, if not navigated right. So, thanks. And Barton, freezers are already full from what I'm hearing. Um, mm -hmm. You're already running into that problem in some areas of the country. And um, so people are trying to sell at whatever price they can get just to minimize their losses because they got nowhere else to put their product now. So they're freezing right. a lot of it, but even that takes up space. So um, prices are cratering in a lot of different species. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the things that could be frozen by the distributors when they were looking at extra fresh inventory that could be safely frozen is all sitting in freezers too. So not just from the producers, but also with the distributors, any items that when this thing dropped off, they had, they if they could freeze it, they were freezing it or donating it. Yeah, of course. And, and that doesn't keep the lights on for those businesses and that doesn't pay the salaries of those fishermen. Of course, you know, that's a huge issue. Um, we had another question on terms of that is for small fishermen that are out there and wanting to get into the selling local um, situation and reaching out to their neighbors, are there any limitations on selling direct that they should be aware of? Uh, I would say, first of all, you, know, you have to build an audience and that's an expensive, time-consuming thing to do. Uh, the other thing is, is that it takes um, one person X number of hours to pack X number of pounds of fish to put in a box and send away to a restaurant or to an auction floor. If you then have to pack that into one or two pound or three pound orders and organize that and communicate directly and take that many credit card transactions and, mm -hmm. you know, this is, farmers markets are very expensive for farmers yeah. to operate. Um, we are now seeing the fish market concepts come up and and so they they think the limitation on that is a can you create the business structure where you're going to be able to deliver and earn loyalty um but also you know are we going to be able to figure out what those margins need to be in order to accurately pro you know, ably profit from that um and of course that's all very feasible to figure out but you know, you know turning on a dime it, it could be hard and uh, mm -hmm. But there are incredible resources out there. Um, if there are any fisher, uh, fishing communities looking for that type of help, uh, the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, MCFA, uh, led by Ben Martins and Monique Combs, are doing simply incredible work, heroic work. Uh, and then another one is localcatch.org, mm -hmm. uh, which aggregates direct-to-consumer sites uh, all over the country. Uh, and I would recommend those both for consumers or chefs looking for products, but also for producers, fishermen who are looking to uh, to start new business models. This is an industry that wants to support each other through this. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to find a lot of peer-to-peer -peer uplifting. Absolutely. And I'm seeing Ben Martin's model. That's definitely uh, one, the way to go. One second. Um, also yeah. seeing Ben Martin's on your point there wrote in a que a question, but a comment saying yes, please reach out. He's willing to help in any way possible. So um that's great to hear but cliff what were you going to add to that point um well we've seen a lot of lobster fishermen just selling lobsters on the side of the road and i hope they're being safe and hygienic out there uh please continue that and it's fun to get lobsters from the, the folks that have caught them but um if if you're looking for some kind of middle ground in terms of someone else maybe selling your your catch for you communities community supported fisheries are, are popping up and growing like wildfire and uh, obviously that's more from coastal communities but um, Barton was mentioning um, local catch um, and and that's a good place to start but uh, if you google community supported fisheries in your state or your your area where you're living you can probably find some more information about uh, networks of, of fishermen and um, support uh, folks who can maybe help sell your fish for you and already have that network built Absolutely. And also the packaging, B, because part of it, too, I mean, I know that a lot of the cardboard producers, sticker producers, I mean, all of that food safe right. packaging is also very difficult to get a hold of. So if you think mm -hmm. about someone that's trying to get into e-commerce and somehow manage the logistics of that, I mean, FedEx, you know, we've been doing this this virtual farm tour series, and I can tell you that we, you know, overnighting fish is a very difficult endeavor right now. You don't know if FedEx is going to show up on time or not, and the rates are really super expensive. So the other thing is, you know, making sure it is packaged right, being able to get the packaging and get set up is also something where you, you're going to have to have some sort of cash to be able to get started. So I am looking at, you know, Fulton Fish Direct and some of the others also that are doing it, that are trying to that are whose businesses are really growing to be able yeah. to look to them and and some of the ones that hadn't been doing e-commerce river and trout and some of the others they're all looking at getting in the game and that's something that i think will stick for the long term yeah absolutely and we have another question coming in now similar to that point which is with all of this going on and so much um, attention on the food sector from government and whatnot 
um, what kind of moves or initiatives should we be expecting from legislation to expand aquaculture production in the U.S.? Um, do we think this crisis will propel it forward or set it back? Um, sure. So um, the Trump administration has made aquaculture, domestic aquaculture production a priority of their uh, approach towards U.S. seafood. Um, so they've appointed um, some new folks and given a little bit more uh, political oomph to the domestic aquaculture um, sector. Um, there's still a whole lot of um, obstacles towards creating an aquaculture operation from scratch in the U.S. Um, and um, a lot of that has to do with the state federal regulations. You're dealing with a whole bunch of different federal authorities that have a piece of uh, the regulatory pie um, when it comes to aquaculture. Um, RAS is a huge movement right now, which is recirculating aquaculture systems. Um, okay. So those are land-based facilities. And those are popping up, like I mentioned, all over the country. Uh, and they're growing everything from uh, tilapia to shrimp to um, salmon to uh, trout to, um, I mean, there's some in Asia that are growing shellfish. Um, so uh, they're popping up and um, it seems to be a lot easier of a um, logistical hurdle for companies to climb to build on land rather than try and get a piece of the ocean to farm in right now. But it's definitely a priority for the Trump administration um, with this whole coronavirus crisis. We'll see how much actually gets done uh, in the remainder of his term uh, on that front. But um, I mean, there's there's a lot of environmental concern on local level whenever a new operation uh, is uh, proposed. And um, you also have people living in those communities that may not want that in their backyards. So um, it's always a local um, issue um, that pops up. And um, it was a much bigger debate three months ago than it is right now. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that we were, I felt getting such great traction on and we had been doing for years, you know, is this idea of healthy cooking helped to get seafood and a variety of different types of seafood on the plate, uh, moving beyond salmon and the things that people were used to. As we move into the word clean being so focused on being like COVID compliant, clean or sterile, that isn't really an appetizing word anymore. And we had really like commandeered that word for clean eating. How do you think the word clean is going to play into uh, menus or into the restaurant experience as we go forward? That was one of the issues that the Culinary Institute of America actually is talking about because part of healthy menus R&D collaborative was actually a clean food section of that collaborative. And obviously it was about, you know, knowing where your food comes from, blockchain, you know, making sure that you were, you know, it, it not necessarily was all organic non-GMO, but obviously having literally the cleanest food that you can. And the definition of clean, they are actually saying is going to completely change. I mean, you've got a virus that lives on surfaces for several days. You've got worries about workers and kitchens. And, and so now when you think about delivery, you're worried about touchless delivery, touchless processing of that food and and they are pretty well convinced in that group that the definition of clean will completely change and it will set back at least that portion of the the food movement it'll be part of it but right now it's going to all go back to you know clean kitchens clean you know processing of the food clean cooking all of that rather than the ingredient itself yeah they'll be talking more about disposal menus and what sterilizer they're using and and that just isn't an appetizing word we're gonna have to come up with a new word for what. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I started to think about that. How you know you're a white tablecloth restaurant, and now you've been told that all your menus have to be disposable. Yeah. You know, I came out with that last week, and it was just thinking about what that experience, how differently that experience is going to be. And when you live in an area like you do, like I do, in the San Francisco area where rents are so high, these mm -hmm. restaurants ha were on such fine margins anyway that if we're spread out six feet apart it's going to be very, very difficult for them to get the turns of the tables that they're going to need to stay in business. And that's all going to be part of the clean definition. Exactly, and while we're on that same topic, you know, when people do get to go back out into the dining experience, um, do we, we've, we've heard from all different sectors, right? From restaurateurs to farmers to you guys now, 
some folks think, you know, they're going to just turn the lights on and all the restaurants are going to open and it's going to be a boom and people are going to be rushing into the streets to go out to eat. And how are people going to, you know, there's going to be a need for so much food to get on the plate. And there are other folks who say, okay, yeah, but the restaurants, you know, PPP didn't work for them or the stimulus didn't come through or the landlord was a jerk and wouldn't help them out. Like, how are they going to buy the ingredients and what will menus look like even in these fine dining experiences? I mean, we've all been home in our pajamas for two months. Are we really going to put on a suit jacket and go out? I don't know. What do you all think about the state of fine dining reopening? Uh, will it be a boom or will it be something that we really have to ramp up towards? Well, I think there's certainly going to be exuberance. Uh, you know, people are going to run out of their houses like it was the first beautiful spring day and uh, that's going to be exciting, and, and you know, as was mentioned before, Jennifer, I think you said it was, a, you know, faucet on or faucet off, faucet on. Um, the, the capacity and the ability to deliver and is not going to. That takes time to build up, and we all have soft openings, and we're going to basically see a nationwide forced soft opening phase. Um, then that that's going to extend to the the products that are on those menus as well, and as you figure it all out. And, um, but yeah, I, I think that exuberant first pop is is going to be significant. But I think it, it's also our responsibility to acknowledge the fact that we are speaking about a very small segment of our population, um, and there's a very very large segment of our population, the majority of it, that never had the opportunity or the ability to go out to white tablecloth restaurants. And, and how do we, as a community, continue to? To acknowledge them, even as we face our own existential crisis, uh, mm -hmm. has been one of the incredible bright spots of, oh yeah, these truly are hospitality professionals, but also at heart. Um, yeah. You know, so kudos to to the entire industry for for all that you're doing. But um, you it, it is an unknown path be, forward for sure. Yeah, one of the things we'll that I heard was imagine possible. what. I'm yeah. sorry. No, it just just imagine what it would be like to have to open a new restaurant all over again because staff will have to be rechanged uh, trained again they'll have to look we'll have to look at menus one of the things that we didn't talk about is you know if you had accounts receivable you were a distributor or a supplier and you had accounts receivable that money is you know gone you know that those millions and millions of dollars are not coming back to our fish and seafood suppliers anytime soon. So mm -hmm. um, it's so uh, you know these are nuances that we have to think about. And if you're a large scale restaurant group, you're only going to have so much capacity to train people and get reopen. And so you think about that opening team and getting back. It's not going to be like hiring everybody, bringing them back in, and off you go. There's there are going to be operational things that will will limit the amount of capacity to reopen. Yeah, of course. And do we think that when people are reopening because of the financial burden that's been put on these restaurants, they're going to be ordering less expensive fish? Or do we think that they'll, you know, maybe pare the menu way down, but still be investing in these, you know, diversity of varietal? I would say we're going to see a consolidation. Uh, you know, the same thing that retail is doing, sell, sell what you know is going to sell. And especially with the perishability issue on top of that, uh, you're not going to bring in four different kinds of seafood and have one chicken entree, one beef, one pork. Um, and the edge of that conversation for a long time. Mm -hmm. Is that any better? <laughs> any better? Yep, you're a little um, bit better now. <laughs> we've been on the verge of the frozen seafood conversation for. Uh, we've been on the edge of the frozen seafood conversation for so long now, and beginning to do away with the legacy bias against mm -hmm. what truly was a tainted food category. I mean, tainted might not be the right word, but uh, not as high quality food category. But mm -hmm. that reality has you know, shifted, and so I, I think that we're going to see by force of uh, market a shift towards uh towards frozen cliff i'm sorry i interrupted you were just about to start not at all um uh, just to build off what you said um that we had a sustainability question earlier and if u.s consumers are more willing to shift to frozen that to me is only a good thing uh as great as fresh seafood is 
if you can freeze something right on the boat or right as it gets to shore, you're locking in that freshness. Whereas if you're buying a fresh piece of salmon that's Norwegian salmon at your local seafood counter, uh, that could have been out for six, seven days. Um, so um, if people get over the stigma of frozen seafood, they're going to be eating better seafood and hopefully that gives them better seafood experiences at home. And hopefully their better seafood experiences home leads them to try different seafood when they're eating out. So, um, I mean, seafood is affordable to all um, price ranges, I think. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I think getting people to accept um, seafood as a regular part of their diet or adopt it or um, build off that, um, that's where seafood needs to start. I mean, uh, if you look at the, the analytics behind the data behind who eats seafood, there's a smaller sliver of the country that eats a whole lot of seafood. And most people in America, I think it's a majority, don't eat any seafood. Yeah, wow. Well, we only have a couple of seconds left and I, or minutes left here, and I want to just appreciate so much everything that you guys have talked to us about. Emily's going to switch from our beautiful faces to a resource slide that you provided ahead of time for folks who are asking about where they can get more education, where they can follow you all um, and get more involved in these conversations. As I said, with only an hour today, I mean, we just barely scared the service of what's going on, and we'll continue to have these conversations in weeks to come. So please email us at impact at jamesbeard.org if you have a topic that you like us to cover if we didn't get to something today and you want to be connected with an expert as to how they can help you out um, my last question to you and we'll just go through the line here is uh cliff what are you cooking right now well um scallops are coming right off the boat uh yep. in maine uh can't do better than that um we actually even though lobster it's not like the technical season uh lobster season in in maine you can still get lobster they're catching them offshore and uh we've done lobster uh, prices are are affordable, so uh, yeah. we've been eating fresh Maine lobster as we do all year long. But uh, um, yeah, in terms of seafood, that's it. No hot dogs. <laughs> no hot dogs, not yet. We'll save those for the summer, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> like a 1920s prisoner eating lobster every day. I love it. It's tough. Um, <laughs> Jen, what are so, you cooking? Well, be, uh, being out in Marin County in the Bay Area, I've been really excited that Hog Island Oyster Company is actually mm. doing delivery in Marin County. And I've been sending boxes to all my family and friends. I think we were talking earlier about a clam chowder kit that has everything mm. that even my uncle, who's not a cook, was able to take fresh clams and cook them in this beautiful clam chowder. And so just, just trying to be creative like that. I've really been trying to get those types of goods out to people that maybe would feel like they needed a little bit of love and support so there's yeah. that and then also really using the freezer as a pantry so I did a series that was all about preserving fish and seafood how to properly freeze fish and put that out into the um, into Instagram and onto a couple of blogs so that if you've got it you know you it's really useful and that you're getting the best you can out of all of those flavors and and ease because I think we want things that are quick right now yeah of course and Barton what are you cooking these days uh, I, I am a very lucky man in that uh, I have a lot of fishy friends, and uh, I get uh, I get boxes pretty regularly of, of stuff from all over the globe, and, and I'm very fortunate for that. But uh, trying as best we can to support local, eating a lot of oysters from uh, just 50 yards away from my house right now, from Emily's Oysters to Love Point, Flying Point. Uh, and to that, I would mention uh, Julie Key uh, uh, has put together a website called oyster.guru forward slash shop. And that is a okay. list of all of the oyster farmers nationally that are doing direct to consumer. So that's oyster.guru forward slash shop. Uh, please I just support. Put that in the chat. Please, please support your local oyster farmers. They are a, a national treasure and, and a help to all of us. Plus, zinc, which oysters are high in, is uh, thought to maybe uh, decrease the uh, the ability for uh, COVID to, or. Uh, um, to, to enter into the body. So I, I can't speak as a medical professional that, but eat oysters anyway. I'll um, take it. I'll take but, it. Uh, but we're eating a lot of frozen seafood around the house. Uh, my pregnant wife is, is, is growing, growing big brains with lots of omegas. But um, if I may also take a minute to yep, uh, deliver some, some not great news, but um, yeah. Uh, so uh, just before this webinar, I found out from a family member that uh, Michael Dimon, uh, 
scion of the of the C to table family and uh, survived by Sean and Katie um, has I, I found out that he has passed uh, today and uh, well, it breaks bra breaks my heart the family that was at our wedding and who, beloved beloved friends but uh, also a hero within within this industry and and to all of these topics that we've spoken about today so this is in our thoughts and prayers as is every other american and human so please yeah absolutely show some love to everybody around you and keep washing your hands so. wash your hands spread love our hearts are with the Dimon family of course um and everybody out there who's struggling to just you know whether it's your business or it's friends, family, people you've heard about um, that are struggling with this particular virus. Our hearts are with you, and we're everybody's just doing the best they can to try and get through the days. We appreciate so much you guys being here with us, sharing your expertise on seafood. I also dropped in um, Barton's uh, ways to elevate canned tuna fish. If you, like me, went out and panic shop, bought a bunch of <laughs> wild planet tuna and need some new ways to jazz it up. Um, so that's in there. And also uh, we'll be sending out the recording of this along with any resources that we continue to find. Jennifer, Cliff, Barton, thank you so, so much for being with us. For everyone else, um, we are going to continue these daily webinars uh, for the foreseeable future here. You can find out more about what's going on with the James Beard Foundation and how the restaurant world is responding to the virus by going to jamesbeard.org relief. There's everything here from the chef advocacy food, uh, toolkits to recipes to blogs, stories, um, even what webinars we have coming up. And that is updated two, three, sometimes four or five times a day. So that's the central place within the organization where you can get all of the most up-to-date info. Um, if you missed one of our webinars in the past, they're all recorded. Those are also on here. Um, and we'll, we'll stay in touch and keep trying to take care of each other and you guys take care of yourselves. And we'll see you tomorrow for a quarantini with our spirited conversation featuring uh, two distillers of our women's programs that we're really excited to share some uh, insight on the beverage community with tomorrow. So thank you all very much for being here. Eat seafood, try new fish. We'll see you soon. Thanks.